Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, professor of physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of February 24. This time around, we start the week in February. We end in March. So we're, we're, we're starting to see a spring sky, no doubt about it. So these are things to look at. Well, Leo and, and Virgo, and these are the things we associate with the evening sky. We're not going to talk about those this week. There you go. Uh, we'll think about it in the coming weeks. Um, let's let's look at March 1, uh, so Saturday night of the weekend question. Uh, we've got the moon sitting 7 degrees. Remember, your fist at arm's length is about 10 degrees, so two-thirds of a fist width at arm's length. The moon is sitting below Venus, and the moon is only about 6% full. If it's much less full than that, it's pretty hard to see. Uh, this may be a little bit challenging for you, depending on what your sky's like and what you have there. But this is about as beautiful a thin, tiny crescent moon as you're going to see with Venus in the sunset glow. This whole region sets about two to two and a half hours after sunset. So you, the sun sets, and then this sets two and a two and a half hours. So you've got a good... You don't need it... First of all, you don't need the sky to be really, really dark to see the moon or Venus either one. You need the sky maybe to be a little bit darker to see the moon when it's this thin. But you don't need a good dark sky. You can see it against background glow of the sunset, either one of these objects. So this should be no problem. But you go out about an hour after sunset or 40, even 45 minutes to an hour and a half after sunset. And that's what you look at. An hour and a half is probably too late. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour after sunset. And this is going to be a great time to check this out. Beautiful, beautiful. All this means Venus is going away from us. I'm thinking back now, last summer, at the end of summer, as the academic year was getting, getting ready to start, and we were starting to get into the full swing of teaching and, and, and so on as August uh, transitioned into September. Uh, we used to go right across the bridge from, from where I live. There's a bridge over the river, and we could go down there in the evenings and fish a little bit and hang out and just watch the sunset. And we would do that. And we would be able to start to pick out the glow of Venus in the, in the haze to the west that we were seeing right there. And we were enjoying being able to see Venus become more prominent in the sky each night. So every time Venus makes an appearance in the sky, we call it an apparition. So this has been a good apparition of Venus in the evening sky, and now it's going away. Within a month, it's gone. Okay, so you get out and enjoy Venus, the big bright dot in the evening sky. Get out and enjoy it now. We talked about last week how Venus is a thin crescent. And so you've got that thin crescent Venus. You've got your telescope. Enjoy the crescent view of Venus. Uh, within a month from now, you will not see Venus anymore. And by the end, a month from the end of this week that we're talking about right now, Venus will have already popped out on the other side of the sun. Uh, it'll be too close to the sun to see in the morning sky, but it's going to make an apparition in the morning sky now. Uh, as we work our way far from spring into summer. So, so look forward to that. Watch Venus go away. Enjoy the moon. That's just a spectacular sight. We've been watching Jupiter near Tau Tari, this, this multiple star in Taurus. So Jupiter is the biggest, brightest dot of light uh, that is not the moon, but the biggest, brightest dot of light in, in this region of the sky uh, uh, you know, it follows Venus. So Venus is the brightest dot of light. And then comes Jupiter. And as the, it, it sets about two in the morning, this region of the sky. And so now when you go out just after dark, you look on the north-south line, that meridian that connect line that connects north to south directly overhead. Jupiter is going to be just a little tiny bit west of that at dark. And so by the time it's good and solid dark, Jupiter will be moved uh, a good bit west of there. Jupiter's in Taurus, uh, hence the name Tau Tauri for the star. And so it moves. Uh, we've talked about Jupiter. Now Mars is in, what is, 24th, uh, at the very beginning of this week, uh, the 25th, I think, Mars ends retrograde motion and goes back into prograde motion. Jupiter's been in prograde motion for a little bit. It's picking up steam and you can start to see it move. So if you want a good project, watch it move relative to Tau Tauri. It starts one and a quarter degrees from it, and it ends about one and a tenth degrees from it. Not very much, but noticeable if you're paying attention. Mostly, you see it move, uh, what on this drawing is left to right. You see it move sort of east to west against Tau Tauri. So see if you can make sketches of it each night uh, and, and pick that out. Tau Tauri is not a super bright star, but if you have decently dark skies, you should be able to see it. So that's, that's our planets and moon for the week. Now, um, above Jup the Jupiter Tau Tauri, pairing, you go 10 and 3 quarters degrees above. So basically one fist width uh, to the north above this, this region, and you come to Iote Auriga. So this is the constellation of Auriga, 
Uh, it looks like a kite as I've drawn it here. The bottom star of the kite is 2.7 magnitude. Remember, the magnitude system counts backward. Uh, fainter stars have a higher number, and we can see down reliably probably the fifth magnitude if you've got pretty good skies. If you don't have very good skies, three or fourth magnitude. But this is a star you ought to be able to pick out unless you really are, you know, if you're living in the middle of a city, uh, you got a lot of light pollution, you'll have a hard time picking that out. So you got Iota Origae there. Now you go up the sides of the kite uh, about 13 and a half degrees either direction. So it's pretty symmetric, about 13 and a half degrees either direction. You get to Capella, very bright star, 0 0.1 magnitude. So big bright star of Capella that you find right there going that direction. And you get to Theta Arriga going this direction, another 2.7 magnitude star. And so Theta Arriga is an interesting binary star. Uh, this is a good test for you. You got your telescope out. Uh, it's got 3.8 arc seconds of separation. Those of you who like to look at binary stars or double stars in your small telescopes, that seems like that should be pretty doable, right? You look at that and you think, well, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. But the, 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 the brightness difference, this 2.7 or 2.6 magnitude, is basically one star. And the other star is a 7.2, very faint magnet, very faint star. So it's, a, it's, it's, you know, five magnitudes would be a factor of 100 times fainter. Uh, so it's almost 100 times fainter, this star. So you've got a really faint star next to a brighter star. That makes it hard to do. And it's going to depend a little bit on the quality of your skies. And uh, so, so you, you know, a small telescope might be a little bit better for this than a large telescope, depending on the quality of the skies that you have right there. So you see if you can split that binary. Now, on the path from iota to theta, uh, you cross about halfway up there. You hit open star cluster M36. Uh, just to the inside, and about, and about, just over two degrees away is open star cluster M38. Uh, M, holy moly, ho open star cluster M38 and M37 out there. Some, you know, uh, somebody must have broken into my office and changed the, the numbering on these things uh, while I wasn't looking. And so just a couple degrees apart. So you get binoculars, you can maybe see these two beautiful open star clusters. Uh, these are good, all three of these are good open star clusters in a small telescope. So you got your telescope out, checking out theta. Check out these three uh, open star clusters in here, here, M36, M38, and then three and three quarter degrees up to M37. So you've got these three uh, open star clusters right in that region. You might be able to see all of them in one binocular field of view if you've got good enough skies and good enough binoculars, but your telescope's got to be great there. Continue on up to Minkalanon at the top of the kite. That's magnitude 1.9, uh, and, and that's about seven and three quarters degrees up. That's seven and a half degrees up from Capella. So again, pretty symmetric. So this is a pretty symmetric kite shape that we have around here. Now, Capella, this beautiful bright star, one of the brighter stars in the sky, uh, it looks kind of like the sun in color. It's got this nice yellowish color like the sun, but it's not like the sun because it's a giant star. But it's actually two binary star systems. And the main star, the brighter, the brighter star in there, the, the one that you see mostly is Capella. Uh, the two components are only separated by 0 0.05 degrees. So you're not going to see those two stars. No way. Uh, this was, we've been talking on and off for the last several months, we've been talking about uh, these binary stars that are spectroscopic, where we see the lines from the two different stars, the dark spectroscopic lines, uh, the absorption lines in the spectra. And as they orbit, one of the stars comes towards you, and that causes a blue shift in its spectrum. Simultaneously, there's a red shift in the other spectrum. So this was a, spectrum, a spectroscopic binary for a long time after discovery. Uh, with a 104-day period. We, had a, we were looking at a lot there for a while. I don't know why that were three-day periods. Uh, this is a 100-day period, so a longer period. Uh, but uh, eventually, we were, this, this star was able to be able to res be resolved into two stars using interferometry. Uh, so interfer this, is a, this is a great interferometric star. It's a great, great interferometry star to be able to see these two, use the interference of light uh, to be able to see these two stars right there. Now, it turns out there's another much fainter magnitude 10 pairing there, uh, a good ways away, 12 arc minutes, and those are separated by 2.7 arc seconds. Uh, pretty hard to do that. You've got a big telescope, you want to give that a shot, go ahead and give that a shot and see if you can see these faint stars separated by just 2.7 arc seconds. Which one of the problems with that is that once you start getting down to magnitude 10 or magnitude 11 stars, there are a lot of stars in the sky, and it's hard to start, as you start to get a sea uh, of stars that you want to pull out. Uh, it's just, you just need a pretty good sized telescope to do it. So that's what we got. Auriga's well placed uh, above Jupiter and Del Torre. Remember, this region sets at 2 o'clock in the morning, so we're talking about going out in the evening to midnight or so to watch this. So this is, this is well placed as soon as it gets dark. 
So this is an evening sky kind of thing. Try not to miss that beautiful crescent moon uh, out on Saturday and see if you can see Jupiter moving relative to Tau Tauri. It'll be moving faster. We'll be moving more next week, so we, maybe we'll check back in on it. That's what we got for you, everybody. As always, thanks for watching, and we hope you have a fantastic week ahead.